We'll uh, have a, a, a couple reminders as we get into the message today of kind of where we've been already, but uh, I, I want to remind us of something else first, and it's uh, the, the only reason I do what I do. It's the only reason that has kept me in ministry, and uh, I, I guess I've made it the, the, the focus of uh, my vocation and... Uh, like I said, the only reason I stay in it. It's that uh, we're about to enter into something right now that is, is no small thing. We are going to be in the Scriptures, and the Scriptures are God's Word. It's amazing to me. God is going to speak today to you. This is not just a collection of, of, of stories. It's not just an ancient book. It is an ancient book, but it is living and active. And it is meant to do a transforming work in all of our lives. And that is the possibility that is before us today. That our lives might be transformed. And that is a very good thing that God has this desire. I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to be left where I'm at. I want to I wanna keep growing. Uh, and uh, this, this is the, the, the chance that is before us today. Uh, the Word of God is living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it can pierce to the inmost parts of our depths and change us. And just a reminder again, all Scripture is God-breathed, and it is useful in our life for everything that God wants to accomplish in our lives. So, all right, that's intro number one. This is uh, message number three in the book of Judges. I'm looking out, and I think some of you haven't been here for uh, part one and part two. So uh, we'll, 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 we'll do a, a, a little review, but I, I think I've, I've been sending out some uh, emails because as we go through an Old Testament book like this, we're, we're, we're biting off some pretty good chunks. This isn't like a New Testament epi- uh, epistle where we, we spend the whole time in two verses, and you can read it right now, and now you're maybe ready for the message. So uh, as I sent uh, out the text for today to, to those of you on our email list, uh, I think I asked the question, did you see any similarities between this text and last week's text? And last week's text was chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through chapter 2, verse 5. What are the similarities? Well, I'll help you out if you haven't gotten there. This, uh, it, it serves as a, a second introduction to the book. Uh, I, I don't know why God chose to in, in, inspire it in such a way to do that, but uh, the, the, the section that we're in today, chapter 2, verse 6, all the way through 3, 6, does indeed serve as a second introduction. What it does is it elaborates on the spiritual and the eventual moral breakdown of a people that was talked about uh, as we kicked off last week. And if last week was the problem of half-heartedness, that was the the, the title, and that was indeed the problem of the people, they served God some, but God doesn't just want some. (laughs) God knows what's best for us is if we give him all and obey him all wholeheartedly and seek him wholeheartedly. But uh, they had this half-hearted problem. If last week was the problem of half-heartedness, this week could be called the problem of idle-heartedness. And uh, lest you think uh, we're not like Israel, I just want to maybe warn you a little bit that we are. Uh, we, We don't serve hopefully, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't matter what we serve. If it's an idol, it's, it's the wrong thing. Um, I was going to say little, little figurines that we've carved, little symbols of, uh, of gods from the past like they did back then. But uh, our idols can look uh, very differently in our time, and we got, want to make sure that we don't have this problem of idol heartedness. Let's uh, just review a a little bit. The major theme of the book of Judges is found in two verses, uh, a little more than halfway through the book. Then the very last verse of the book says this, in those days Israel had no king. 
All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Read that to yourself now. Within yourself. Go ahead, read it again. (laughs) Does it sound familiar by any chance? Does it seem familiar? I'm not talking about familiar from the Bible. I'm talking about familiar to the times that we live in, perhaps. Really, nothing new under the sun is there, as the Bible says. I I, I think our times are are very much like uh, like, like the times of the judges where so many people are doing whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And at some level... You know, we, 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 uh, we, we, we got to allow the Holy Spirit to do his own conviction. But at some level, we, 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 probably, we all do this from time to time. Uh, Herb has called it uh, through the years, uh, Godship. It's another way of saying it. We, we, we want to sit in the throne of God instead of have God sit there. We want to be our own king. We want to call our own shots. And uh, when we do that, I guess the, the question could be asked, how, how's that working out for you? I know it doesn't work out too well for me when I'm in that place. And uh, only one can sit in the throne of God, and it is God himself. But uh, all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. That is the theme of the book. And we looked a little bit at, uh, about a, a, a cycle that's found uh, throughout the book of Judges. And when I say cycle, I mean it's something that uh, is constantly repeating itself. The people rebel. We call it the word relapse here. Uh, And it leads to something. If we rebel and stay at our rebellion long enough, your life is going to be ruined potentially. And this is what happened to this, this, this land, this nation of Israel, over and over again. They relapsed, they rebelled, uh, they w- went into a time of, of, of ruin, and it was perhaps ultimately God's mercy that, 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 that did this, maybe, maybe an act of grace, it seems weird, but he allowed oppressors to come in. Because when that happened, and after the land went into the, to, to, to ruin like that, then it was finally kind of a, a time where we, we realize again, and how many times have, have we done it? You know, maybe we, we, we go through our time of, uh, ah, let, let's, let's try living my way. Let's, let's live apart from God a little bit, and things can get rough, and all of a sudden we're, we're reminded, oh, yeah, I, uh, I need God. <laughs> I forgot about God, so they repent. They, they change their minds, they, they change their ways, they, they turn back to God, and what does God do? He restores them. He restores the land, and they enter a time of rest. And he, he does this restoration through what is known in, in, in that time as a, a judge. They, they, they came in a time of chaos, and they, 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 they brought some order, and they led the nation back to God. The problem was, as these cycles continued, even the judges got worse and worse. And we're going to end the book with uh, the last judge, Samson, who God used to deliver a people, but his life was an absolute train wreck. (laughs) And what we looked at in my intro to the book, one of, one of the, the themes a couple weeks ago is that this is all God has to work with. He use, uses train wrecks like Samson, train wrecks like me. He can use train wrecks like you because our lives can end up being that sometimes. And God is so good that he uses people like us. If you want to add one more R to that cycle, you can just put in parentheses after rest, repeat. And then we go back into the time of, of relapse, rebellion against God. And this, this went on and on. Uh, I think I mentioned perhaps 450 years this went on. Some scholars think 350. So let's just say somewhere between 350 and 450 years this went on. 
How old are we as a nation? <laughs> I, I keep coming back to that because I'm just astounded by it. Uh, God's timetable is, is amazing. That this, probably one of the darkest periods in Israel's life, went on for 350 to 450 years. Thank God he remains at work, even in spite of us bringing chaos to a land. And we're in Judges. Again, just a reminder uh, to you. Everything that was written in the past, and we're talking things of the Scripture, those things in the past, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now, God might have to say some hard things. There may be some hard lessons for us as we look at his scriptures, but uh, it's not to beat us up ever. It may be to convict us that we might turn ourselves back to God so that we can find hope again in our lives because everything else is just a temporary hope. Everything else is e even a false hope. We've got to find our ultimate hope in God. So let's look at our text for today, starting with Judges 2, verse 6. Uh, if you got your Bibles turned there, we're, we're going to be throughout here, and not much of it's going to end up on the, the, the screen because there's, there, there's so much. But uh, if you're close to Judges, you'll be close to Joshua too, which we're going to look at a little in a little bit too. Uh, verse 6, though, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, this is the way chapter 1, verse 1 begins. So here, here's the second introduction again that's going to elaborate on the first. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. This is the generation of Joshua that this text here says served the Lord. And they did to some degree, but it was only a degree. Because if you back up to Joshua, he's going to tell us something else. Joshua 24, let's start with verse 14. Joshua is, is near the end of his life here, at the end of his book. And he says, now fear the Lord and serve him. With all faithfulness, throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river of, of, of Egypt and serve the Lord. Perhaps throw away your idols, because anything other than the true and the living God is a mere idol. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable for you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve." whether the gods are your forefathers beyond the river, all the false stuff. Joshua says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Have you decided this for your household yet? Who or what you're going to serve? Uh, verse 16, then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord and serve other gods. Verse 17, it was the Lord uh, our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt, the, this great act of salvation, delivering the whole nation from the, 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 the mighty power that Egypt was, and he delivered them from, from those centuries of slavery. Again, centuries, folks. It would appear that God has all the time in the world, but we don't. <laughs> So let us use our time, the, the, the vapor of life that we are here on this earth, let us use it wisely and look to this God. Joshua exhorts them, serve God. And they said, yes, what else would we do this generation? Then verse 19, Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He, he somehow perhaps knew their, their, their hearts, being the man of God that he was. But it's kind of it, 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 it stark to see. You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins if you stay at it and never acknowledge it to him. 
If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been so good to you. This is the warning that they got. And Judges is all about this forsaking that they entered into. They, 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 it's as if they ignored the warning. Verse 23, Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. One author says this about uh, what we've just looked at so far. If this imperfect, flawed generation, Joshua's generation, if this imperfect and flawed generation, clearly already struggling with the foreign gods that are among you and not able to serve the Lord can be described in positive terms in the book of Judges, it begs the question, what would a truly idolatrous generation look like? Well, we're, we're, we're about to find out. Remember the headlines from a couple weeks ago from the book of Judges? Absolute disaster. Absolute chaos in the land. People have, have just lost their minds. And it all seems, again, kind of familiar as I look at the world around me. As we're in a bit of a land of chaos ourselves. We seem to be in this rebellion. We seem to be in this relapse. Will it lead to ruin in our land? Is anybody thinking about these things? No, they're not. Because they're not thinking about God. And they're not heeding his warning. They're not looking to the past in what has already happened, which are intended to teach us today. So Joshua and his generation die off. Joshua told them, you're not really able to, to, to serve the Lord. <laughs> they, they gave it some, some, some good, I guess, half-hearted efforts. But man, what comes next? Well, Judges 2 verse 10. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. Verse 12, they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served gods of the time, the idols, Baal and Asherah, the Ashtoreths. Maybe that'll come up again, but uh, we'll, we'll just leave that for, for now. Let me just uh, say, generation, we got a couple generations in here. I, I, I often stop and I, I, I speak to the kids, and then I turn around and I say, now this is for us big kids too, because we're, 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 we're all kids and we all need it. But for whatever reason, I've prayed for like, like my oldest daughter and, and, and those younger, like, like Catherine sitting here, this generation. I, I don't know why, but years ago, it was put on my heart. I have prayed that this generation would be the greatest Christian generation that has ever been seen in our land. And uh, I, may I say, I, I, I fear almost that... We are going to need you to be the greatest Christian generation that our nation has ever seen because we have forsaken the living God and we are running away from him at breakneck speed. Do, do you realize this? Do you understand these things, brothers and sisters? We are running far, far away from God and we are heading to ruin because of it. Don't think it can happen. Check out 350, 450 years of history of God's chosen people, Israel, on the face of this earth. This is what we should learn from the book of Judges. These, these first couple verses, uh, 10 and, and 12, and 
FF just means the, 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 the following verses too. And this enters, this is just a, a, a clear example of the cycle of the judges uh, in, in, in all of chapter 2. And you can clearly see this cycle if you want to take some time yourself and, and look into that. But uh, man, we, we, we've now entered this relapse phase with this new generation. And again, I encourage younger generation, choose what kind of generation you're going to be. What, 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 what generation are you going to be? Seek God. It, it, it's just, it, it, it's utter foolishness not to. Now he's patient and kind. He gave me time. <laughs> he's, he's patient and long-suffering. He gave me time to, to finally get serious with him and, and turn to him. But I can enter, as we've looked at before, I can enter that cycle myself. And to some degree, we're all somewhere in that cycle of the judges. And we've got to evaluate where, where we're at and, and take appropriate action, whatever it may be. But uh, as, as verse 10 indicates, we've, we, we've started this, uh, the, this relapse phase, this, this rebellion phase. And uh, man, they, they did not want to revere and rejoice in what God had done, and they, 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 they served idols. And the biggest failure of their time was disobedience to God in what God had revealed to them. And what he revealed to them is that I will be right at your side and I will drive this, this utterly godless people who are sacrificing their children in the fire. I will drive them from the land. And we saw in their half-heartedness last week in those, in those opening chapters that they just half-obeyed the Lord. And that was an utter failure. It was disaster for them. And I think in God's grace and in his kindness and his mercy to us, we can rationalize things in our own lives and, and, and think that rebellion against God is, is not a serious thing. Tell that to the God's people in the time of the judges that it's not serious. They paid a, a dear price going into utter ruin. And the seriousness of it, uh, seriousness of it is, is that it was not just a, a spiritual downfall, it eventually led to, to moral downfall and utter ruin. It's as if perhaps God's patience can only last so long. And man, that's a, that's a slow burn with, with, with the Lord. But uh, man, there, 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 there's a time coming when he will no longer contend with sin on the face of this earth, when the sin becomes so heinous. And we are doing terrible things in, in, in the sacrifice of, of, of children. And then we make one small move away from it <laughs> in, in ending abortion, and, and the land erupts in outrage. And it didn't outlaw anything, <laughs> sadly. And then the sacrifice continues with the teaching kids things contrary to, to, to God, confusing them about things of, of sexuality when God has made things very clear. We are in this time of chaos like, uh, like, uh, like, like the judges. But uh, let, let's look at uh, just three things. From this big text, uh, I think we do uh, after-action reports, we call them in the Army. Um, hospitals might call them perhaps a, a bit of a debriefing, but we'd have after-action reports, and, and part of the after-action after, after report after a field training exercise was uh, what, what, what are the lessons learned. So since this was written for our benefit so that we might have hope and turn to God, let's look at the lessons learned from this text today. First of all, God's salvation must remain precious and central to our lives. Because the generation after Joshua forgot about it. We 
We sung a lot about uh, the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Somehow in God's ways of doing things, this, this sacrifice of himself, God in human flesh, atones for our sin, covers our sin. Is that precious to you? Or is it foolishness to you? Scripture says that the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God for salvation. What is it to you? Is it foolishness or is it God's power? Is it precious to you? Now, 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 now the reason that it becomes so precious, it's when you get I, I just see some video that Dewey posts every time. I, I see myself kind of for the first time on, on camera. It's like, dude's getting old. <laughs> just for the first time in my life, I'm, I feel like I'm starting to look old. I know I've lost my hair, but I'm, I'm, I'm also starting to kind of look a little bit old. And in my faith that has been around for a while now, the blood of Christ remains so precious to me because I still struggle with sin. <laughs> because I still might be in that cycle of the judges somewhere. Now, the, 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 the goodness of God, I, I'm usually pretty quick in my failings to turn back to him, to confess to him. And he, he, he knows it all. And somehow, some way, in, in, in his love for me, he, he delights in that. Oh man, look at look at Tony again. He's he's, he's understood <laughs> that he that he kind of got off my path a little bit. And it's not that it's not serious. It's just that I already belong to him because the blood of Christ covers my sin. I'm just my salvation is not complete yet. He's got work to do in me yet. And he will finish what he started in me. And this is precious stuff. Is it precious to you? Or is it just religious mumbo jumbo? Because to me, it is anything but religious. It's life. If you don't mind me saying, we're, 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 we're a family here. So we... we uh, I got a brother I just noticed yesterday. His name is Tony. It's not me. I'm not referring to myself. It's that guy right over there. I, I, I talk to him often. He comes to me or I go to him and we, 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 we talk about Jesus. I've just kind of noticed in his life, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, Rhonda, I don't think there's ever been a time where my brother Tony is talking about Jesus and he doesn't, his eyes get red <laughs> and, he, and he tears up. That's God's salvation being precious to him. And I think it's precious because he's such a great sinner. <laughs> now, I'll throw myself right in that camp with you, Tony. I think this is why the salvation is so precious and we seek to have it be central in our lives. But look at verse 10 again. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, that's Joshua's, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. That, that, that is so key. They didn't know the Lord. If you don't know the Lord and you're active in church and you take communion and do baptism, you're just religious. And I don't know if you ever noticed from the New Testament, but Jesus himself seems to not be overly impressed with the mere religion of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He wants people's hearts he wants people's love. He wants them to know the greatness of the love of God. And that comes by placing faith in this Jesus. But they didn't know God's salvation. For them, it looked like deliverance 
from uh, slavery all those centuries in, in Egypt. That's a, that's a form of salvation. It's just a picture of a greater salvation to come. But God has taken care of his people along the way. And there are, are faithful people who, who are his throughout all the times. But they're his only because they have faith in him. Because their works are never much. <laughs> They don't turn out to be much, and we can fool ourselves that we're doing something good for God. And we do if we do them in, through faith in Christ and in the power of the Spirit. And Man, nothing we do is ever in vain. But if we think that we're earning some sort of favor by doing these things with God, you've got to heed the prophet Isaiah who says, your best works, apart from faith in God, are nothing but filthy rags before this holy and perfect God. But this generation didn't know these things. Knowing speaks of intimacy. I mean, man, it's, it's, it's a euphemism even for God's beautiful plan of the sexual relationship in, in marriage of one man and one woman. Adam knew Eve. Speaking of the... And she conceived. And there was intimacy there. There wasn't using. There wasn't just mere self-gratification. There was an intimate knowledge of, of one another. And this is the way God wants us to know him, intimate like this. Uh, write down John 17, 3. After growing up, practicing mere religion in my own life for 20 years, I came to faith in Jesus Christ. I somehow understood that his cross was about my need and his love for me. And that whatever he did there, though I might not understand it all, that was for me. And he loves me. And he can right my relationship with God through his work on that cross. And I, I somehow understood that in 1985. And, and John 17, 3 became such an important verse in my life. It's Jesus praying to the Father. And he says, now this is eternal life. That they, and when I saw that they, I said, as me, that they might know you, the only true God, and know Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's the definition of eternal life. It is salvation, knowing God. Now this generation, it says they, they even forgot what he had done. But constantly, kids, young generation, help me out here. I know this isn't maybe the most exciting thing. Are you with me, Catherine? All right. This is exciting, Catherine. Come. I, I know. Rebecca? <laughs> now, what was I going to say? You're growing up in church. Make sure you're a generation as you grow and get older, that doesn't forget, that intimately knows the Lord. And you begin this, this, this intimate knowledge by placing your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ. Never let that be just a, a, a part of your life or over here for on Sundays, but let it take fruit and take root, take root in your life that fruit might come out of it as you get older and older because it is life. It is life itself to know the Lord in this way. And the truth that he has forgiven our sins through his work on the cross on our behalf. John 17, 3. And then Jeremiah 9, 24 says the same thing as John 17, uh, 23. You can jot that down. Jeremiah 9, 24. If people are going to boast, God says, let them boast of this one thing, that they know me. That they know me. And I've always said, I know I don't know everything about this great and awesome God who at some level in his transcendence our minds can't fathom, but I do know this. I know him. And even more importantly than that, he knows me. And I think somehow in his grace, in his mercy, he sees the end product. As I live my life on this earth, tripping and stumbling along the way, sometimes struggling with sin. But he sees that end product, that, that my faith in Christ began 
And it's through Christ's work that I'm going to be glorified someday. He's going to finish this process of salvation. And I think he sees that. And he is well pleased. And he delights in us as we sang about. Do you have that view of of yourself? that, that, That God delights in you? He does in Christ and through your faith in him. Now, what is evil from this text? This this should be in our faces a little bit. We got all kinds of notions of what evil is, and we see it in so many different ways on this earth. But but how does God define evil? Verse 11, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served idols. They served something other than God. God calls that evil. To serve something, to worship something other than him. Now this smites and this flies in the face of all mere religion on the face of this earth and the idolatry that is practiced in these religions. God calls it evil. And it's our biggest problem. It really is. This is why this is so serious. It is serious business to fall away from the Lord and begin living our lives contrary to what he has revealed. And when we talk about knowing God, it's about knowing him relationally, personally, knowing that he, he died for our, our sins, his love is that great. It's not just knowing about. And kids, generation be, uh, before me, make sure that you're spending your time in church, that you're growing up in church, just not learning facts, just not knowing things about God. Make sure that you get to the point through your faith that you know God. I think we give that opportunity around here time and time and time again. Probably because I grew up 20 years in church not knowing God. This is why this is so important to me. God's salvation must remain precious and central to our lives. It didn't in this next generation of Israel after Joshua, and it cost them dearly. Lesson two, God's compassion is great despite our unfaithfulness. And somebody say, praise the Lord. (laughs) Because this is all of our struggle. We're we're, we're not there yet. Even the great apostle Paul had had to admit, "I, I haven't arrived yet. But I I do press on to lay hold of what Christ has won for me. And he never gave up in it. He never gave up because he knew that God was the ultimate one at being faithful. And he is making us like himself so our faith will grow. Don't be utterly defeated by your still struggle with sin, brothers and sisters. Because you are not utterly defeated You are victorious in Jesus Christ. It is just time to embrace it and lay hold of it and stay at that good work of confession before him where you got to get real and say, God, here I am again. Blew it yet again. And and it's such a great thing that he's given us in in prayer and confession. But our standing before him has, has not changed. We are righteous in Christ This is why if we're going to boast about anything, I boast that I know him, this Christ, who holds me fast and will not allow me to ultimately fall away from him. Oh, God's compassion is great despite our unfaithfulness. You write down verses 14 to 18 in the text of Joshua 2. Let me just read it real quick, and here you're going to see the cycle. They... uh, 14, in his anger, after they, they worship these, 
these, these false gods. And, and, and oddly enough, maybe not oddly enough, I think Satan always takes, first of all, maybe the most precious gift of, of God in, in creating children and, and the, the, the sexual union of, 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 of husband and wife. Uh, just I always said, if we could just get uh, the, 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 the sex stuff right, think of, think of the pain that could be eliminated from the face of this earth. Just, I mean, sex trafficking in our time, broken relationships because of unfaithfulness and adultery. I mean, just think of all the, the pain that could be avoided if we just heed God's ways in this. So Satan takes it and twists it and distorts it, God's plan for human sexuality. And we see the distortion in our time. And it's celebrated in the world. Now, I'm not, I, I condemn nobody, or I'd have to condemn myself. But we must acknowledge that we need forgiveness in these things. And we must turn back to God and seek to follow his ways, or, or it's going to lead to ruin in our lives. So he, he's, he's perhaps twisted this plan of God more than any other area in the world today. It was the same back then. Because in his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to, to raiders who plundered them. And why did he do that? Because they forsook him, verse 13, and served Baal and Ashtoreth. Asherah literally means grove. And you know what they did? They, uh, they, they went out in their religion, in their idolatry, and they had sexual relations, just whoever. <laughs> and you know what the purpose of that was? The purpose was to get the gods to lust. So that they would have, it was a fertility cult. And it would somehow bless the land with, with, with good plants and, and livestock and such. This is why Eugene Peterson in, in the message rightly translates throughout so much. He just called the, the sex and religion God. Because that's what was going on. And Satan always takes this great gift of God and twists it and distorts it. And it leads to ruin in people's life. Will, 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 you, will we ever believe this? Or will we keep going our own way to our own utter destruction? God sold them to their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Verse 15, whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them. Why? Because they were practicing evil. And God's not going to let them continue in it. They, were in, they got to the point where they, they were in great distress, these people. Verse 16, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders, yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. That's no small word with Baal and Asherah. They prostituted themselves. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned away. They quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of obedience to the Lord's command. But then verse 18 leads us here. In spite of that heinous unfaithfulness, whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. And this is perhaps one of the greatest hopes for me as a 58-year-old Christian who should be much further along all these things we tell ourselves, further along in the faith than I am. And you tell yourself some of those same things, I know. I should be much better at prayer than I am. I should know more of the scripture than, than I do. I've squandered so much time, on and on it goes, and those things might be true. But God's compassion is great, despite our unfaithfulness. But let us not remain 
in that place of unfaithfulness. Verse 19, when the judge died, the people returned to the ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and their stubborn ways. So the cycle begins again. And God eventually, as the people cry out, has compassion on them yet again, despite all their unfaithfulness. We go back to Joshua, and he says to the good generation, you can't serve the Lord. Can you serve the Lord? (laughs) Not really. (laughs) But when he gets inside of us through faith in Christ, and his spirit comes and lives in us, We have hope. Even with that spirit, though, how good do we do? It's kind of like this, isn't it? (laughs) So much in our... Well, hopefully it's more like this. (laughs) You know, we we do grow, but uh, we're, we're, we're tripping and falling along the way. This is where the Lord's compassion is so precious. And it better be precious to you because it's the only hope You've got, and he is faithful to his people. So last thing, let us seek to pass our tests. We'll fail some along the way. Repent of it. (laughs) Change your mind about it. God willing, soon change your ways after that. This is this is this is repentance. And get, get on God's path and pass our tests. Verse 20, Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, Because this nation has violated the covenant I laid down for their forefathers and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations left when Joshua died. I will use them, verse 22, I will use those nations to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their forefathers did. The Lord allowed these nations to remain. He did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. So they had to live with the idols among them. And how did they do? (laughs) Mainly this. Mainly ruin. Chapter 3, verse 4. These, again, to emphasize it, these nations were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's commands, which he had given their forefathers through Moses. Warren Wiersbe says this, The Jews eventually became so accustomed to the sinful ways of their pagan neighbors that those ways didn't seem sinful anymore. Guard yourselves, Americans, because we are in this land of chaos. Read it again. The Jews eventually became so accustomed to the sinful ways of their pagan neighbors <clears throat> that those ways didn't seem sinful anymore. The Jews then became interested in how their neighbors worshipped until finally Israel started to live like their enemies and imitate their ways. And God called it evil. And it had a ruinous effect in their lives. What might the cycle look like for us? Our cycle, just like the cycle of the judges away from God. This is from the new covenant. We live under this, this new covenant in Christ where we know that these things are ultimately covered if we have faith in him. But our lack of living it out can eventually, there are consequences to it. And it can eventually bring ruin to even God's people, as we see in, in, in Israel. But as we live it out, may, 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 <clears throat> may the world see it. 
and turn to this living God. But the, the, the cycle is, is very real, and it starts with this, friendship with the world. Now, when I say the world, I mean, I mean this world system that the scriptures define as being contrary to God and his ways. The world system, not the people of the world. We, 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 we seek to love the people of the world. And in, in part of love, you cannot separate love from the truth. And I'm seeking to tell truth today about the chaos that we're, we're living in and teaching our kids and all these things. If we say, oh, all that stuff is good, it's friendship with the world. So it starts with friendship with the world, just, just like it did for Israel in the day. Then it goes to being polluted by the world. James 1.27 says that we're, 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 we become polluted by it. We're so influenced by it that we're corrupted and polluted by it. And then it turns into to love of the world. Man, we love what the, the world has. I love pursuing these things. I love gratifying my own flesh. I love using other people. I love deception. I love idols. I love worshiping anything but the true and the living God. I'll worship myself. I'm number one. I gotta watch out for number one. Friendship with the world leads to being polluted by the world, leads to loving the world, leads to being conformed to the world. And this is happening even in the evangelical church of our day that claims to operate under the authority of God's word. And they are becoming conformed to the world. When the truth is, brothers and sisters, believers in Jesus Christ, we are not of this world. Scripture clearly says that. We are strangers and aliens. We are just passing through. I, I feel that more deeply than I've ever felt it in my life, that I do not belong here. This is not my home. I pray to the Lord, use me for some good. Help me to bless my family. Help me, help me to do some good in this, these ministries you have given me. But other than that, I, I want it no more. Because this place is not my home. And I feel it as you get older more and more keenly. We are not of this world. I'm not of this world. But yet I fall short. <laughs> I fall short in, 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 in my own cycle of the judges sometimes. What do we do? What do we do with it? Well, we do what we've always ever done from, with it. And we looked at it in depth last week. You either run away from Jesus like Judas did and he killed himself in his regret over loving the world too much and forsaking Jesus. Or you be a Peter and you run to Jesus. And this Peter also forsook the Lord. Remember, he tell, told everybody at the mock trial, I, I don't know him. Never, never knew him. I, I don't know the guy, I tell you. Forsook the Lord. There's a big difference in what you do. And every... <laughs> Every season, maybe even every moment of our life, we've got that choice to, to make. Run away from Jesus or run to Jesus. If you've never run to him ever in faith, trusting in him, the scripture says you're dead in your sin. But this is great hope for those of us who have believed on him, received him, in our still struggle with sin, where we might find ourselves somewhere. He's still got us. He's, he's merciful. He's, he's kind. He's already taken care of it on his cross to the point of Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
Now, we already see in, in, in Judges, I said it's just going to get worse and worse. The end of last week's message, when, when, when God told them the deal, like he's told us today, it says, when the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud. And they called that place Bochim, and there they offered sacrifices to the Lord. They sought to run to him. But at the end of today's message, it says the Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. Now, now, now speaking of God's faithfulness, just, uh, just take note of this. There are still Israelites today. I don't hear much anymore about Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. It is utterly amazing. There are still Israelites today. You talk about God's faithfulness. But the people then, they took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters and sons in, in marriage to, to these lands. Now, we can't really apply this to, to today. None of this can we apply today. We'll, we'll never go on a conquest from God like, like Israel did to take a land. That's a whole other thing. But this happened in that time because God revealed it. This doesn't teach racism by any means. It shows, again, the seriousness of idolatry because he knows if we intermarry here and there, the nation's soon going to fall away from the living and the true God. What do we do? Same as last week. You can run from Jesus or you can run to him because his cross has done this in all of our lives, if you've believed. The cross of Christ is the grave of our sins. Even though we can still struggle in it, God knows that we are but dust and he will, he will get us home. We keep running to Christ. We keep relying on him. We never stop preaching the gospel to ourselves because we are in such need ourselves. Here endeth the message for today. Let us pray. <laughs> Lord, we thank you that you remain faithful even when we are faithless. We thank you that you don't give up on people. Even when we bring chaos to our lives, even when a whole land ends up on, in chaos, you don't give up. You keep reaching out with the truth of Jesus Christ, saying, return to me. Offer the forgiveness that only I can give. Only I can make you right with God. You just simply must believe this. So Lord Jesus, we are here to say today, we need you and we believe that you give on your cross what only you can give. Right standing before God, the covering of all our sins, and now we can be known as children of God for all eternity. I believe in you, Lord Jesus, and pray these things in your name. Amen.